We have arrived at the conclusion of our series on Jesus' parables. For the past ten weeks, we have studied the stories that Jesus told to his followers. Stories intended not just to entertain, but to teach about God, the world, and our job as followers of Christ. We have attempted to view these stories from a variety of perspectives. We have considered the outlooks of the different characters within the text. And we have attempted to understand how the original hearers would have comprehended Jesus' words. We have explored the characteristics found in each of the parables. They each have a twist a surprising moment when the unexpected occurs. This doesn't just captivate the reader, but it is often the part of the story that challenges us, the part that makes us think twice about our role in the world. The parables use regular, everyday objects. They are relatable, Perhaps not always to our 21st century ears, but they would have been to the people in Jesus' time. They aren't stories that were difficult to understand because of their ambiguity. They are concrete, and they have layers upon layers of meaning. We have heard ten of Jesus' parables We've considered how the kingdom of God is like a pearl, a mustard seed, yeast, and workers. We have wondered about relationships. Who is the focus of the story of the prodigal son, and who is our neighbor? We have considered economics and justice, faithfulness and forgiveness in the stories of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the widow, and the judge. We have pondered the importance of our foundations through the parable of the builder. There are so many more parables we could consider, as there are almost 50 found in Scripture, many of which are told by multiple gospel writers. And we can use the themes and the methods for understanding them that we have applied as we read them in the future. But today we will finish this series with one of the most complicated and unfamiliar parables, the rich man and Lazarus. We hear first a description of the rich man. Scripture says, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted every day. These words don't translate to us exactly how rich this man was. He was rich almost beyond comprehension. Purple robes were reserved for the most important people and were the most expensive. Culpepper indicates that only certain people were even allowed to wear the color, So he was likely a high-ranking official or a member of the royal family. Barclay, in his commentary, gives an estimate to the cost of one purple robe. With consideration of changes in currency and inflation, the robe would have cost around $360. It doesn't sound astronomical, but this would be the cost, he writes, if a daily wage were around 40 cents. The rich man feasts daily. It is the Greek word euphrino, and it goes beyond eating. It is, as Levine writes, what people do at major festivals. It is in direct contrast to the description we are about to hear of Lazarus. The parable continues. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, 
covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. It is important to note that this is not Jesus' friend, Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Lazarus was a common name. As the vine writes in Hebrew, Lazarus would be Elizer, which means God helps. She continues that we will see the irony of his name as the only help that Lazarus will get will come from God since the rich man is not doing what God commanded. So we have on one hand a man who is rich beyond our comprehension, and on the other hand we have Lazarus, who is poor beyond comprehension. Lazarus is sick and hungry. He is lying at the rich man's gate. The Greek is balo, which indicates that some person or people actually had to place him there or even throw him there. He may be too weak to even move. He longs for something to eat. And as Culpepper writes, the verb here, to eat, is commonly used for the feeding of animals rather than humans. The text says that even the dogs would come and lick his sores, and there is debate as to the interpretation of this. I'm guessing the first thing that popped into your head was some expression of, ugh. And maybe that is the reaction that Jesus was going for. But it could be that the dogs were the one companion that he had. And the saliva of dogs, according to Levine, was known to have healing properties. Perhaps here we are reading about his only comfort, that the dogs were the only group on earth that helped Lazarus. The story provides for us opposing lives, which, as we read, are separated by a gate. There are not only social barriers between the two, but there is a physical barrier to even further demonstrate the separate and very different lives these two men led. The parable continues. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. We get here the first glimpse of the surprise, the reversal of roles. Lazarus goes to be with Abraham, which according to Culpepper was understood to be the place of highest bliss. Abraham's title as father epitomizes, as Levine suggests, protection, provision, and hospitality that which Lazarus did not receive while he was alive. The rich man's story continues, where we hear that he was in Hades, where he was being tormented. The rich man sees Lazarus in the place where he wants to be, and he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to bring him even a cool drop of water. He has not changed his ways. He knows who Lazarus is, signifying he intentionally ignored Lazarus during his life. And yet, as Levine writes, he continues to think of Lazarus as nothing more than a servant or a dog. Abraham responds to the rich man saying, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, 
and no one can cross from there to us. This is uncomfortable. An initial reading of this indicates the finality of the man's choices, and it speaks to the dangers of wealth. We would be remiss if we don't explore this more. Because if we argue that this parable only has something to say about what is to come, then we might argue that we should just let the poor stay poor because it would be better for them in the long run. But that idea goes against all of Jesus' other teachings and how he lived his life. Perhaps there is an element of what is to come in the parable, but it is certainly not the whole story. This speaks more, I think, to the dangers of wealth. Let me be clear that this does not mean that money itself is dangerous. Having money or not having money will not determine your relationship with God. Having money may make you more susceptible to greediness or stinginess, but it does not change your faith or who you are as a person. What matters is what you do with whatever you have. To the Jewish people, the people who would be hearing Jesus' parable, there would be an expectation for people to help those who have less. We read this in Deuteronomy 15.7, where we are instructed, if there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving to you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your needy neighbor. And a few verses later, in verse 11, we read, Since there will never cease to be some need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy neighbor in your land. Levine points out that the concern in Jewish scripture, broadly defined, is not what we have, but what we do. We read these commands in the New Testament as well. Matthew 5, 42 says, Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Luke 14, 13 and 14 says, When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. What this parable does for us is that it moves us from a vague description of the rich and the poor and it puts a face on them. It's harder to ignore an issue when you see the person behind the issue rather than just the issue itself. This text, as Scott Bader Say points out, presents us with the great moral challenge of seeing and then making visible the invisible suffering of the world. Who are the invisible suffering in our world today? Who are the people like Lazarus? Certainly there is an overlap with the suffering in the story The poor are still with us and still need help. But this is a parable. It can be applied to more situations than it explicitly names. So who else are the invisible sufferers in our world? They are the 20 million people being trafficked around the world today. 20 million yet somehow we never seem to see them. They are the 42 and a half million American adults and then add to that number the children and others around the world. 42 and a half million who suffer in silence from mental illnesses. They are the single mothers and fathers who cannot afford to work because of the great expense of childcare. Who are the invisible suffering in our world today? 
How can we make sure that they are seen, that we recognize them and their importance, and how can we help them? This parable requires that we see the suffering in our world and that we act upon it. This is where the rich man in the parable failed. Even after he dies and goes to Hades, he still doesn't get it. He realizes his fate, and in the one moment of humanity that we see from him, he wants to save his brothers from suffering the same fate. But that moment of humanity is fleeting. He, fr he first asks Abraham to send Lazarus to them. He is still treating Lazarus as a servant. And as Levine writes, he has not yet learned what landed him in torment in the first place. He wants to save his brothers from th the torment, but not to ease the pain felt by the millions who lack food, shelter, or health care. While this parable may have something to say about what is to come and economics, they are not the focus. They are not the most important point that we can take away from Jesus' story. What matters, what we need to focus on, is Jesus' emphasis on relationships, on how we treat each other, that we pay attention that we see the people who are suffering and we move away from our own perspectives and try to see what they endure. And then that we attempt to do something about it. That we use whatever resources we have, time, money, relationships, we use them to make this world a little kinder and a little more friendly to those who suffer, how can you make a difference? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.